was metabolism. Please always remember to subscribe, share the comments, like the video, and keep sharing to others so that we can grow our channel. Today we want to discuss how does the body utilize glucose. In the previous video, we saw digestion, absorption, and metabolism part of it. Now today we want to go to process by process to see how does glucose use it in the body. How do we how does our body utilize glucose to provide energy? And the first step is always glycolysis. So that's what we want to talk about today. And glycolysis, we must know what is it. We must answer this question, what is glycolysis? Where does it occur? When does it occur? Then how and why? These questions must be answered. And they are questions of life. We need always to know that. So we want to know what is glycolysis. And the glycolysis, these are series of reactions, series of reactions that occur to convert. If I have glucose, and this glucose is converted to pyruvate, glucose is converted to pyruvate, that is in the presence of oxygen, or glucose is converted to lactate, or what you can call lactic acid in absence of oxygen. This is absence of oxygen. But the end result of all is the release of energy. There is release of energy in the form of ATP. So glycolysis, this is a process by which glucose is converted to pyruvate in the presence of oxygen and the lactic acid in the absence of oxygen. And where does it occur? This process occurs in the, in the cytosol of cells. It occurs in the cytosol. Cytosol of cells. And what are these cells? Majorly we see it in the liver and the skeletal muscles. So we see it in the liver and extrahepatic tissues like skeletal muscles. So it occurs in the cytosol. And when does it occur? Or what triggers it to start? What triggers glycolysis is increased levels of glucose in the blood, or we can say reduced levels of ATP. When ATP is low, or when glucose is high in the blood, it triggers glycolysis. Okay. And then how is the reason, is what we are going to look at. Those are the steps, which series of steps which occur in glycolysis. Then we shall end up by giving the significance. So let us look at the steps in glycolysis. Steps. In glycolysis. And this glycolysis, it occurs in this series of steps whereby if we have glucose, In in cells, glucose is converted to glucose six phosphate. Then it is converted to fructose six phosphate. Then it is converted to fructose one six bisphosphate. This phosphate, and then this fructose six bisphosphate. When I have here, as I will take it this side, we shall see this one being cleaved to form dihydroxyl, to form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone. Dihydroxyacetone. Then this is going to continue to be converted as I will show you. So, we have glucose, and what enables glucose to enter into cells? We know that if we have cells, if this is a cell, there is what we call glucose transporters. And in the river, we have GRUT2. And if I have glucose here in the presence of insulin, insulin is the one that enables entry of glucose in cells, in the presence of insulin. So whenever there is increase in sugar levels in the blood, 
we see the beta cells of the pancreas releasing insulin, and this insulin causes the entry of glucose into cells. And once glucose enters into cells by the help of insulin, it is converted or it is phosphorylated to glucose 6 phosphate. And this reaction, we see hydrolysis of ATP. We use energy to produce ADP plus phosphate inorganic. And whenever you see ATP involved, think of a kinase enzyme. And here the kinase enzyme used in the liver, it is glucokinase. If it is the liver, we use glucokinase enzyme. Then in the extrahepatic tissue, extrahepatic tissue, we use hexokinase. So during the phosphorylation of glucose, the glucose 6 phosphate is that if I have a 6 carbon sugar, this is 6 carbon, this is also 6 carbon, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We are seeing addition of a phosphate group at carbon number 6. This is carbon number 6 of glucose, forming glucose 6 phosphate in the river catalyzed by glucokinase and in the extrapatic tissue catalyzed by hexokinase enzyme. So what does hexokinase enzyme do? It gets a phosphate group from ATP and adds it to glucose at carbon number six to form glucose six phosphate. And this is the first rate limiting step. It is irreversible. It is, rever it is irreversible. Then we see conversion of glucose six phosphate to fructose six phosphate. And this is just an isomerism. We are changing the position of the phosphate group. And this one is characterized by phosphor, phosphohexose isomerase enzyme. This isomerase enzyme is the one that is characterizing the arrangement of the glucose molecules to form fructose 6-phosphate. And this reaction is reversible. It is not a rate limiting step. Then after forming this fructose 6-bisphosphate, no, fructose 6-phosphate, we see another phosphorylation process whereby we are going to inject another ATP to form ADP plus phosphate inorganic. And whenever I see ATP, I think of a kinase enzyme, and this enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is known as phosphor Fructo kinase type 1. You can abbreviate it as PFK. <coughs> so phosphofructokinase type 1 is going to get a phosphate group from ATP and adds it to fructose 6 phosphate and adds it at carbon number 1. That if I have a 6 carbon sugar, you know we already have a phosphate group at carbon number six. So what phosphofructokinase type one do is going to add another phosphate group at position number one. This is position number one, this is position number six. So we see formation of fructose one six bisphosphate, bisphosphate, bisphosphate. Why do we call it bisphosphate, not biphosphate? It is that these phosphate groups are on different carbon atoms. So when they are on different carbon atoms, we call it bisphosphate. And when they are on the same, we call it bi. So we call it bi bisphosphate because the phosphate groups are on different carbon atoms. And this one is the second rate limiting step. It is irreversible and it is a second rate limiting step. So after Forming, why were we forming, putting phosphate group at carbon 1 and 3? Is because there is a molecular scissor called enolase enzyme. And this enolase is going to come and cut this compound into two equal molecules. So we're going to see enolase coming and cut here. And this enolase, no, this is aldolase. The aldolase enzyme comes and cuts between here to form two molecules of three carbon whereby this is a three carbon, and this is a three carbon sugar. 
And these two guys, for them, they are interconverted. You see interconversion of dihydroxyacetone to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate by an enzyme known as triose phosphate isomerase. So triose phosphate isomerase is the one that catalyzes the interconversion of dihydroxyacetone, which is, has a keto group to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So from this step, we were supposed to have continued. We see we have now formed the two molecules, one molecule, second molecule. So we are going to take one step, that is glyceraldehyde phosphate, but after being converted to pyruvate, we see also the hydroxyacetone being converted to glycer. So everything we are going to be multiplying two by two, everything. So we are, we are going to see, to go to this, let me zoom it this side, whereby when we have glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, glycero, we had dihydroxyacetone being converted to, even we have glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. These are two molecules in the presence of triose phosphate isomerase. So we are going to move with one, but everything we are going to multiply by two because we have two molecules of three carbon sugar. This is a three carbon, this is also a three carbon. So this one is going to be converted to one, three, this, four, this phosphoglycylate. Then this one will be converted to three phosphoglycylate. And this one is going to be converted to two phosphoglycerate. And this one is going to be converted to phosphoenopyruvate. Then it will be converted to pyruvate. Pyruvate. The other one is, is, is a three carbon. This is also a three carbon. Three carbon. Three carbon. So meaning we have three carbon molecules, three carbon molecules, three carbon molecules, and three carbon molecules. And everything, as I told you, we are going to multiply by two. Why? Because we are assuming that also this step is going to be, but we don't want to separate them. So we are going to be multiplying each compound by two. This one will be two molecules, two molecules, two molecules, two molecules, and two molecules considering dihydroxyacetone. So what happens is that after forming glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, which is a three carbon sugar, what is going to happen is that we need, we are going to see oxidation reaction, whereby we are going to oxidize glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate in the presence of NAD plus producing NADH. Two molecules, two molecules, because everything is multiplied by two. And whenever I see a dehydrogenase, I see NAD, I think of a dehydrogenase enzyme. And dehydrogenases are named according to the substrate they are catalyzing. So the enzyme here is going to be glyceraldehyde, 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. So this is the enzyme, whereby it is oxidizing glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate to form 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. That already we have a phosphate group at carbon 1. We have already a phosphate group at, this is now carbon number 3, carbon number 3. We are adding another phosphate at carbon number 1. And where is it coming from is that ATP is indirectly producing a phosphate, there is addition of a phosphate group, a phosphate inorganic, which this phosphate inorganic during this oxidation, we are adding it at carbon number one, forming 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And this reaction is reversible. It is a reversible reaction. And here we are appreciating there is a production of NAD. There is here a production of two NADs, which we can shuttle 
in ETC, in electron transport chain, and can produce for us three ATPs. So we shall see in aerobic respiration, this NADH can be shuttled in electron transport chain to produce three ATPs at this stage. Then another following stage is conversion of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to 3-phosphoglycerate. And this reaction is called a, a substrate level phosphorylation. This reaction is the first substrate level phosphorylation. What is a substrate level phosphorylation? A substrate level phosphorylation is a, is a type of phosphorylation whereby a higher energy compound, 1,3-bisphosphylacylate being a higher energy compound, it donates one phosphate group. It comes and donates a phosphate group at carbon number one to a lower energy compound. And when it donates it, we see ADP plus phosphate inorganic being converted to ATP. So a higher energy compound donates a phosphate group to ADP to form ATP. And this is what we call substrate level phosphorylation, whereby a higher energy compound donates a phosphate group to ADP to form ATP, a lower energy compound leading to formation of ATP without going into electron transport chain at the substrate level. That's why we call it substrate level phosphorylation. So this is the first, first level, substrate level phosphorylation, where we are producing ATP directly. And remember, everything is two, because we are using two molecules. So we produce there are two ATPs at substrate level. Then we form three bisphor, three phosphoglycerate. But there is another pathway, like in red cells, RBCs which lack the mitochondria. And we know that RBCs contain hemoglobin. And this hemoglobin is the one that transports oxygen from lungs to respiring tissues. So we can see 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate being converted to 2,3-BPG. And this 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate is the one that lowers it lowers oxygen affinity. It lowers hemoglobin affinity for oxygen. So that when, when hemoglobin is carrying oxygen to respiring cells, it is able to dissociate with oxygen in the presence of 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, which is formed by the process known as rupaport rubbering pathway. That this rupaport rubbering pathway is whereby 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is converted into 2,3 BPG. And this BPG when it is present, it is the one that lowers affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So that hemoglobin is able to give out its oxygen to respiring cells. And it can also be reconverted back by a phosphatase enzyme. So after forming this compound 3 phosphoglycerate, it undergoes isomerization, and this reaction is a reversible reaction, whereby in the presence of a mutase, what we call phosphoglycerate mutase enzyme, it catalyzes the isomerization, whereby a phosphate group at carbon number three, if this was my phosphate group here, this is my three carbon sugar, it was at carbon number three phosphate, it is now taken to carbon number two is shifted to carbon number two, the phosphate group. And what is doing that is the phosphoglycerate mutase, whereby it gets and shifts the carbon, the phosphate at carbon number three, and shifts this at carbon number two, forming two, two phosphoglycerate. And that is a reversible reaction. We can reverse it. It is not a very limiting step in the presence of a mutase. Then, after forming 2,3,2-BPG, two, 2-phosphoglycerate, two 
it is converted to phosphoenol pyruvate it is known as phosphoenol phosphoenol pyruvate and this phosphoenol pyruvate we see an addition of the eno group what happens is we are adding an eno group eno functional group to two phosphoglycate by the enzyme known as enolase so being adding we just add enolase so enolase enzyme adds an eno group to two phosphoglycerate forming phosphoenol pyruvate and this enzyme laboratory is utilizing it and how because in laboratory when we want to determine glucose levels what happens is that we use a fluoridated bottle sodium fluoride bottle and this fluoride is a poison for enolase how because this fluoride inhibits the action so fluoride inhibits so when i collect a blood sample a, sugar, a sample for blood sugar determination and i collect it in a fluoride bottle which is always gray in color this fluoride inhibits enolase so that if glycolysis does not occur after collecting the sample to get wrong results so we preserve the levels of glucose using sodium fluoridated bottle and this fluoride its mechanism of action it acts by inhibiting enolase enzyme which adds an eno group to form phosphoenol pyruvate so in the lab we are utilizing it as an antiglycolytic agent to stop glycolysis after collecting blood for glucose determination then the phosphoenol pyruvate formed by the action of enolase we see it perform being converted to pyruvate which is a three carbon sugar and this conversion of phosphoenol pyruvate to pyruvate is this pep is the higher energy compound and being a higher energy compound is going to donate a phosphate group to donate the phosphate group that if i have adp i will plus a phosphate group from a higher energy compound i form atp and remember everything is two so these are two and this is two and that's how we are able to form and whenever i see atp involved i think of the kinase enzyme and this is known as pyruvate kinase pyruvate kinase enzyme catalyzes the conversion of pep to pyruvate and this one is the second substrate level phosphorylation this is the second substrate level phosphorylation whereby here we are producing also two atps directly without going into electron transport chain whereby this higher energy compound pep donates the phosphate group in the presence of pyruvate kinase forming pyruvate so this is how we are able to convert in aerobic respiration how we are able to convert glucose into pyruvate which is a three carbon sugar and this pyruvate formed in case it is anaerobic in anaerobic condition we see this pyruvate being converted to lactate where this formation of lactate it involves the utilization of nadh and it is a reversible reaction whereby we utilize nadh to form nad plus or oxidized nad so this is in anaerobic in absence of oxygen in the presence of oxygen we form only pyruvate in absence of oxygen pyruvate formed is converted to lactate by enzyme known as lactate dehydrogenase lactate dehydrogenase enzyme is the one that catalyzes this reduction of pyruvate to lactate so these are the reactions that occur in the krebs cycle after seeing them we have to know to give the accountability and give the significance so let us begin with the significance of krebs cycle after seeing formation of pyruvate we go back at our questions we have answered how now we want to answer why glycolysis 
What is the importance of glycolysis in our body? That is the significance of glycolysis. And there are major three significance of glycolysis, whereby one, this glycolysis, it provides a precursor. It, is a, it provides a precursor that is pyruvate, there is formation of pyruvate, and this pyruvate is the precursor for formation of acetyl-CoA, coenzyme A. We can use pyruvate to form acetyl-CoA, which this acetyl-CoA can feed Krebs cycle to provide energy and water and carbon dioxide. We can use this acetyl-CoA for lipogenesis and ketogenesis. So that is one of the significance. One of the significance of glycolysis is to provide pyruvate, which is a precursor for formation of acetyl-CoA. Then the second significance is that it provides energy, provides energy in cells that lack mitochondria. For example, red cells lack mitochondria. So red cells are able to get energy from glycolysis in form of whereby there is provided this ATP, which this ATP can be used by cells that lack the mitochondria like red cells. So red cells, or even it provides energy, which is the only step that provides energy in anaerobic conditions. In anaerobic conditions, that is in absence of oxygen, cells are able to get energy by glycolysis. Then the third significance, number three, is that we, I saw you this pathway which we call Rupert Rubering pathway, where we convert one of three bisphosphoglycerate to two or three bisphosphoglycerate. And I told you that this compound, when it is produced in red cells, it lowers the hemoglobin affinity for oxygen, so that the hemoglobin is able to release oxygen to the respiring cells. So another significance number three is production of two, three BPG, which lowers hemoglobin affinity for oxygen. Then hence, the hemoglobin is able to release this oxygen to respiring cells. So these are the major significances of, of glycolysis. Then after seeing the significance of this step, we can see how is it regulated? How is this glycolysis regulated? And glycolysis, if I can clean here and I use this place, we want to look at regulation. How is it regulated? This glycolysis is regulated in two ways whereby one is hormonal and another one is allosteric inhibition. Allosteric inhibition. Whereby hormones, we have like insulin, which stimulates glycolysis, and we have hormone like glucagon, which inhibits glycolysis. And which enzymes do they inhibit? They target enzymes at the rate limiting step. Especially the enzymes that are stimulated or inhibited, we have enzyme like this number one, which is glucokinase, glucokinase, stock hexokinase. Because it's a rate limiting step, we have phosphofructokinase type one and pyruvate kinase. So these are the enzymes that catalyze the rate limiting steps in glycolysis. So these enzymes are stimulated by insulin, but when there is insulin, it stimulates these enzymes to catalyze the reactions. Then the glucagon, for it, it inhibits their action. That is hormonal regulation. The second type of regulation is allosteric. This was the first one. The second is allosteric. 
whereby a loss a loss comes from the Greek word which means others. We have seen hormones directly inhibiting or stimulating. But at this step, we see other compounds indirectly affecting the action of these enzymes, these three enzymes. Whereby we see when there is increased ATP, increased cyclic AMP, increased levels of citrate, all these ones are sterically inhibit the reaction of these three enzymes. Then the final is the products they form. Products whereby hexokinase is inhibited by high levels of glucose 6-phosphate. Phosphofructokinase is inhibited by increased levels. As we have seen, we are forming increased levels of Fructose 1,6 bisphosphate inhibits allosterically this enzyme. And also pyruvate kinase is inhibited by high levels of pyruvate. This is what we call allosteric inhibition. So inhibition or regulation of glycolysis occurs in two ways. That is hormonal and allosteric inhibition. Whereby hormonal we have hormones like insulin which stimulate these enzymes and glucagon inhibits their action. Then we have seen an allosteric, whereby increase in ATP, cyclic AMP and citrate means there is increased energy. So allosterically they exert a negative feedback for these enzymes to stop working. Then also products like glucose 6-phosphate inhibiting allosterically glucokinase, then fructose 1,6-bisphosphate inhibiting phosphofructokinase type 1, then increased levels of pyruvate inhibiting pyruvate kinase, allosteric inhibition. So that is the regulation of glycolysis. So lastly, we want to look at accountability. We want to look at how many ATPs are utilized. Because in each process, you must give accountability of the energy used. And we see at step number one and step number Number three, we are seeing, we are using ATP. And this is ATP number one, ATP number two being used. So we use used ATPs, we use two ATPs, or we raise two ATPs to initiate in the initial phase. But we are seeing at sub, we have two substrate levels, whereby during conversion of this compound to this, we are seeing there is production of two ATPs. Then also during conversion of PEP to pyruvate, another production of two ATPs, making it a top toe of four at substrate level. At substrate level, we produce four ATPs. Produced four ATPs at substrate level. We are also seeing production of two NADs during conversion of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate to 1 3 bisphosphate glycerate. And this, we said that when this NAD are shattered into the electron transport chain, one molecule of NAD H, when shattered in the electron transport chain, we form three ATPs. And we see we are producing two NADs. There is production of two NADs, NAD H. And each NAD produces three molecules of ATP in the electron transport chain. So we get two times three, which is a total of six ATPs. That is when shattered in electron transport chain in aerobic respiration. So aerobically, we see the gross, gross number of ATPs produced during glycolysis is six plus four, that is 10 ATPs are produced. But however, remember we use the two. So the net ATP, you get 10 minus two, which is equal to eight ATPs. This is during aerobic respiration. This is for aerobic respiration. The presence of oxygen. 
But in the absence of oxygen, in the absence of oxygen, in anaerobic, we utilize two ATPs, we produce four ATPs, at, at, that is at substrate level, making it a gross of six, the gross is four ATP, then the net ATP is two. This is in anaerobic, in absence of oxygen. So in absence of oxygen, we see production of net to ATPs. In the presence of oxygen, we see production of net of six ATPs. And this is how we utilize glycolysis. Thank you so much for listening. Always remember to subscribe on our channel. Share and like the videos. As we have seen the significance being major three whereby it is production of pyruvate which is used as a precursor for acetyl CoA, then the production of energy in anaerobic respiration and the cells that lack mitochondria and also production of 2,3 bisphosphoglycerate by rupaport rubbering pathway which produces, which lowers HB affinity for oxygen. So we have seen what it is we have seen where it occurs in the cytosol of the cells. We have seen when it occurs, that is increased the levels of glucose in the blood or reduced energy levels. And we have seen the how it occurs and why it occurs. Thank you for listening. Keep updated on our channel. Thank you so much for listening.